Hi everyone. Welcome to chapter 8 on patterns of inheritance. In our last chapter, we were discussing the process of meiosis, which is the process that brings about the existence of the gametes, which are the sperm and the egg. And in this chapter, we are naturally going to continue that discussion by discussing how traits are passed down from parent to offspring in this process called inheritance. Inheritance is an extremely important concept, and it has been an extremely important concept for thousands of years. Humans have depended on their understanding of how inheritance works, which for a very long time was very simple in that humans could recognize that offspring tend to resemble their parents, even if they didn't know how that it worked. But this was important nonetheless, because it contributed into this phenomenon called selective breeding, by which humans were able to uh, take organisms with desirable traits and enhance them by choosing which organisms got to breed. For example, this guy right here is called a mouflon, and this species is thought to most closely resemble the ancestor of modern domestic sheep. Fast forward to today, and sheep look like this. This is Shrek the sheep um, from New Zealand. And uh, Shrek was a sheep who managed to escape being sheared by hiding in a cave for five years. And over those five years, he was able to grow this massive amount of wool on him. Um, he became a national icon. He even got to meet the prime minister of New Zealand at the time um, after he was recovered. But the reason why I'm telling you this story is because it ties back into inheritance and how our understanding of inheritance made this possible. It made it possible because many thousands of years ago, humans were able to recognize that offspring resemble their parents, and therefore, if they took the wooliest domestic sheep and bred them together, then they would end up with woolly offspring. And if they kept doing that over and over again, they could guide the evolution of these domesticated animals in a particular direction until you end up with the monstrosity of Shrek the sheep that we have today. So hopefully this anecdote leads you into this concept of inheritance nicely. We've already defined inheritance as the transmission of qualities from parent to offspring. And it simply refers to the observation that the traits of offspring tend to resemble the traits of their parents, which is something that we already know. A trait is any inherited characteristic of an organism that can either be physical or behavioral. So. Like we said, people knew that this was a phenomenon that happened for a very long time, but they didn't know how it worked. They didn't know what was the physical mechanism by which genetic information is passed down from parent to offspring, because they didn't even have this concept of genetic information in the first place. One early hypothesis about how the process worked was called the generative fluid hypothesis. And this stated that when two parents mate, they end up blending samples of generative fluid. And when those samples of fluid mix together, they produce offspring that have some sort of an intermediate trait that's somewhere in between the trait of the two parents. So for example, um, what this would look like is if a red flower mates with a white flower, then their generative fluids would mix together and produce something that is a blend of the two, which would be pink flowers for their offspring. Now this sounds okay, um, until you realize that if this were to be really the case for how inheritance worked, and you had multiple different uh, external appearances of organisms, as they interbred with each other, everything would just sort of blend together over the generations until eventually everything would look exactly the same. And this, of course, is not what we see in nature, and so it was known that the gener generative fluid hypothesis couldn't be entirely true. It wasn't until later that this handsome gentleman came along, 
named Gregor Mendel, and he proposed what was actually going to be the true and accepted hypothesis for how inheritance works, and is now known as the father of modern genetics. Mendel was a monk, um, and although he was a monk, he was also an amateur botanist, and he had a lot of time on his hands. And so during his spare time, he liked to grow pea plants. He chose pea plants to study because they have a lot of advantages in terms of being a test subject. They are small, they reproduce, and they grow quickly, and they have many varieties of different traits that can be observed, and they had also been studied extensively by other researchers. Finally, pea plants can be fertilized in a controlled manner, which is a very important characteristic because what Mendel was doing was he was growing different pea plants and then he was choosing the ones that would get to mate with each other. And then he would look at what their offspring looked like and uh, try to come up with an idea of how the inheritance of those traits worked. What you can see him doing in this depiction right here is taking this little paintbrush-like structure and essentially transferring the pollen from the flower of one pea plant over to the flower of a separate pea plant. And in doing this, he was able to act more or less as the pollinator, such as um, a honeybee, and transmit the pollen between two different flowers and choose the organisms that mated in order to observe the results. And as you'll see as we talk about his experiments, he did this literally tens of thousands of times. He did this so many times, I cannot even stress to you enough how boring it must have been, but he did it, and because he did it, and because he observed all these thousands of offspring of these pea plants, we have the modern theory of inheritance that we know today. Before we start talking about his experiments in more detail, Let's take a look at the anatomy of a pea flower, which is the overall reproductive structure of the pea. And it's important that we look at this because peas are not like us. In humans, the male reproductive parts and the female reproductive parts are found in two separate organisms, whereas in pea plants, they are found in the same organism. Specifically, the female gamete what we would think of as like the human egg, is found in the ovary down here in this part of the flower. And those female gametes are called ova. And the male gametes, or what we would think of as being like the sperm of the flower, is found in the anther. And the anthers are these little bulbs that are sticking up here. So what this means is that it is both possible for a flower to mate with itself, as well as for that flower to mate with other individuals. Self-pollination is what happens when the flower is allowed uh, to have its pollen become exposed to its own ova. And cross-pollination is what you get when you take the pollen of one flower and transfer it to the pollen of a separate flower. And both these things are possible because the male and female reproductive cells exist in the same flower. So now that we understand what the pea plant looks like and how its pollination works, let's take a look at what Mendel did in his experiments, and eventually we will look at what he found. Before all of Mendel's experiments, what he did was produce true breeding varieties of peas. True breeding essentially means purebred. And in order to do this, what Mendel would do is allow one variety of pea to self-pollinate for multiple generations in order to ensure that it consistently produced offspring that always look the same. So in other words, if the pea plants had white flowers, he would allow that pea plant to reproduce with itself over many generations to make sure that it always yielded white flowers and never any other color of flowers to make sure it was purebred. So a true breeding organism is one that always passes down certain traits to his offspring, and this is what Mendel made sure of before he started his experiments. Let's take a look at what he did in his first experiment. What he did is he took two true breeding varieties of peas, 
that had different textures to their pea seeds. One of the parents was true breeding for a round or smooth texture, and the other parent was true breeding for a wrinkled texture. He crossed these parents with each other, and he found that in the next generation, 100% of the offspring looked like the male parent with its round texture, rather than like the female parent with her wrinkled seeds. Now, before we move forward, uh, let's get a little bit of terminology straight here. The generation here, as you can see, is labeled the F1 generation. And that stands for the first filial generation that comes from the parent seeds. So this generation is considered the parent generation. And then from it, we get the F1 generation. After this, he allowed all of these uh, smooth textured F1 generation peas to self-pollinate and self-fertilize to produce the F2 generation. So it goes parent, F1, F2, and then if you proceeded, it would go F3, F4, etc. In the F2 generation, which came from the F1 generation self-pollinating, self-fertilizing, he saw these numbers. And I wasn't kidding when I said he did this thousands of times. There were 5,474 smooth textured peas and 1,850 wrinkled textured peas. What was interesting and striking about this is that even though the F1 generation was 100% consistent of peas that looked like the male parent, in the F2 generation, he saw the wrinkled texture reappear, even though it wasn't in the F1 generation. Now, if we look at these numbers here, what is the ratio of round peas to wrinkled peas in the F2 generation data? You can get this ratio by dividing the first number by the second number. And give me this value out to two decimal points. How many round peas to every, uh, how many wrinkled peas were found in this generation? So keep that number from that last checkpoint in mind. We're going to move on now to talking about Mendel's second experiment. In his second experiment, he was not investigating the texture of the pea plants, but rather the color of the peas themselves. And so he, again, took two true breeding varieties of these peas, one that was true breeding yellow and one that was true breeding green, and he crossed them with each other. This is considered the parent generation. In the first filial generation, the F1 generation, he found that 100% of the offspring were yellow, like the male parent, and not green, like the female parent. Then, just like in the first experiment, he allowed the F1 generation peas to self-pollinate. And in the F2 generation, these are the numbers that he got. 6,022 yellow peas to 2,001 green peas. So what is the ratio here of yellow peas to green peas? Well, just by looking at it, you can probably tell that it's pretty close to three to one. And if that sounds familiar, and I'm not gonna make you calculate this one, if that sounds familiar, it's probably because your other number that you got was also pretty close to three to one. And in fact, Mendel did this same pattern of crossing two true breeding varieties, not for one, not for two, but for seven different traits in these pea plants. He looked at seed texture, seed color, flower color, flower position, the height of the plant, the shape of the pod, and the color of the pod. And every time he did this, he came up with a F2 generation ratio that was very, very close to three to one. So he knew that something was going on here because this couldn't just be the result of randomness. There has to be some sort of explanation for this consistent three to one ratio. So Mendel's first investigation and his first hypothesis that he came up with 
was dedicated to addressing the question of why are the F2 ratios always so close to 3 to 1. The hypothesis, which we now actually call a principle because it is so sound and well supported, is today described as Mendel's principle of segregation. Mendel's principle of segregation stated that instead of the genetic material being a fluid, like was stated in the generative fluid hypothesis, the genetic material was actually made up of these discrete particles. He also hypothesized that in any given plant, every trait is determined by exactly two of the particles. One particle that comes from the male parent and one particle that comes from the female parent. And then finally, he hypothesized that one of the particles dominates over the other. And although Mendel referred to these things as particles, Today, we recognize that what he was really talking about are genes. A gene is defined as a segment of DNA containing a set of instructions for a particular process or product. We know at this point, based upon what you've learned in this class, that every individual organism has a double set of chromosomes because they are diploid. Half their chromosomes came from their mom and half came from their dad. And when that organism goes to pass down those chromosomes to their offspring, they will only pass down one or the other. This is where the idea of segregation comes into play, because what segregation means is to keep apart. And so when this was described as the principle of segregation, what it was really referring to is the fact that when organisms make their gametes, they actually segregate their chromosomes in such a way that the gamete only has a haploid set of chromosome in it. The chromosomes get separated, as we saw when we discussed meiosis. Hence the fact that every parent only passes down half of their genetic information to their offspring because their chromosomes get segregated into haploid gametes. Now, we know that genes are made of DNA, and that DNA is a type of nucleic acid which is composed of nucleotides. So in this checkpoint here, for the purpose of reviewing and leading into the rest of our discussion, I want you to describe for me the structure of a DNA nucleotide as we have learned it. Now, I don't want to give away the entire answer for that last checkpoint, but I do want to highlight that one of the important components of a nucleotide is the nitrogenous base. And the nitrogenous base can be four different things in a molecule of DNA. It can be adenine, which is represented with an A, guanine, represented with a G, thymine, represented with a T, or cytosine, represented with a C. And as we discussed previously, the order of these nucleotides, the order of these nitrogenous bases in a molecule of DNA is like a four-letter language for spelling out instructions that uh, induce the cell to carry out its different processes. So the fact that there's this language that has four letters, this is the basis for another concept that goes hand in hand with genes, and that is alleles. Alleles are any of the alternative forms of a gene that vary in the order and content of their nucleotides. Now I have two completely hypothetical examples for you. Um, let's say that the trait that we're talking about is freckles, the presence or the absence of freckles on the face. There are two different possibilities. Either a person has freckles or they don't have freckles. And these are encoded by two different alleles, or in other words, two different versions of the gene that controls freckles. If you were to look at the actual piece of DNA that represents this gene, allele 1, which encodes freckles, might have this particular sequence of letters, whereas allele 2, which encodes lack of freckles, 
might have this particular sequence of letters. You can see that they differ in their nucleotide content, and therefore they differ in the instructions that they provide to your cells. This is the basis of different versions of genes and uh, alleles that can bring about different forms of a trait. A few other terms that we need to define at this point are genotype and phenotype. Genotype is a term for the alleles that an individual possesses for a particular gene. Phenotype, on the other hand, is the observable trait or set of traits that result from the genotype. So for example, continuing with this uh, trait of freckles versus no freckles, an example of a person's genotype would be to say that a person has the allele for freckles on his maternal chromosome and the allele for no freckles on his paternal chromosome. This describes the particular set of alleles that an individual possesses. The phenotype is essentially what they look like outwardly. So an individual who did have this genotype with one allele encoding freckles on one chromosome and one allele encoding no freckles on the other chromosome, this individual would have the outward appearance of possessing freckles. Now how could this be? How could it be the case that if this individual has one allele saying no freckles and one allele saying freckles, he ends up with freckles? How does the body choose that? Well, it's because certain alleles are dominant while others are recessive. A dominant allele is one that overrides the expression of another allele when they are present together. And by convention, the dominant alleles are usually indicated with a capital letter. On the other hand, a recessive allele is one whose expression is overridden by another allele when they are present together in combination, and we indicate recessive alleles using a lowercase letter. So getting back to that example of freckles in humans, in humans, as you may imagine at this point, the allele for the presence of freckles is dominant. An individual like the hypothetical person we just looked at on the last slide, who has one of each allele, will end up having freckles for their phenotype because all their, although their genotype is mixed and they have one of each, the dominant one overrides the recessive one and therefore freckles are expressed outwardly. So, if for a given trait, there are two different alternative versions of a gene, the dominant version and the recessive version. And given that every individual has two chromosomes, two sets of this gene, then there are actually a total of four different possible genotypes that an individual can have. Continuing with the example of freckles, it is possible that a person can have the dominant allele on their maternal chromosome and the dominant allele on their paternal chromosome. In other words, they receive the allele for having freckles from both parents. Another possibility is that a person could have the dominant allele on their maternal chromosome and the recessive allele on their paternal chromosome, meaning that their mother passed down the allele for freckles where their father passed down the allele for no freckles. It could also be the opposite. And then finally, the last possibility is that both maternal and paternal chromosome pass down the allele for no freckles. So these are the four possible genotypes. What are the phenotypes that these genotypes would yield? Well, obviously, a person with this very first genotype, capital F, capital F, would have freckles. That's all that's written in their genes. This person has a mixed genotype. They have one capital F and one lowercase f, but because the capital F is dominant and tells the body to make freckles, the lowercase f is overridden. That is likewise the case for the third possibility here. And for the final possibility with the two little f's, this is the only way that an individual can have no freckles at all if they have two copies of the recessive allele and no copies of the dominant one to override them. 
This brings us to the introduction of a few other vocabulary words that we need to know. Heterozygous is a term that refers to an individual or a genetic locus that has different alleles for a given gene on homologous chromosomes. So heterozygous with the prefix hetero meaning different, if we were to pick the genotypes out of this lineup that are heterozygous, it would be these two right here because these are the two that have a different allele on their maternal or their paternal chromosome. Homozygous, on the other hand, refers to a genotype that has identical copies of an allele on their two sets of chromosomes. And so if we were to pick out of this lineup the genotypes that are or homozygous, then we would pick these two right here. Now, of course, there are two different ways to be homozygous. There is homozygous dominant, in which case a person has two copies of the dominant allele, but there's also homozygous recessive, in which case a person has two copies of the recessive allele. So now let's get back to Mendel's experiments here. It is indeed the case that for every trait that Mendel studied in these pea plants, there were only two possible alleles for each gene. In other words, it was only possible that the peas could be yellow or green or wrinkled or smooth. It wasn't possible for them to have any other trait. And it also was the case that one allele was dominant over the other. For example, when we looked at the texture, the smooth texture was dominant over the wrinkled texture, and the yellow pea skin was dominant over the green skin, and so on. So now that you have this understanding of how inheritance works in our modern terms, let's go back and think about Mendel's P's. And using the letters capital T and lowercase t, I want you to tell me what are the possible genotypes that a pea plant could have for the gene governing seed texture. And in addition to that, tell me what the phenotype that would be uh, that would come from each of these different genotypes. And remember that smooth texture is the dominant one and wrinkle texture is recessive. So to summarize, what are all the possible genotypes that a plant can have for seed texture and what are the phenotypes that correspond with them? Now that you've listed the possible genotypes that plants can have for seed texture here, let's go back and decide which of those genotypes were in the parent generation of Mendel's first experiment. We know that he had true breeding, round textured parents crossing with true breeding, wrinkled textured parents. And because we know they were true breeding for their uh, respective traits, we can assume that their genotypes were homozygous meaning that they had two copies of the same allele and they didn't have anything else in their genotype. They weren't a mix because they always produced offspring that looked a particular way. This means that the round parents genotype was capital T, capital T, and the wrinkled parents genotype was lowercase t, lowercase t. These parents were of course crossed in order to produce the F1 generation. When they did this, the pollen of the male parent fertilized the ovum of the female parent. What genes did they introduce when they pollinated or fertilized in this manner? Well, let's talk about what we would have found in the pollen of the male parent. As we know, when the male parent produced its gametes by undergoing meiosis, then it would take these two chromosomes and split them up so that in each pollen granule, there was only one chromosome or a half set of genetic information that it was passing down to its offspring. This is also true with the female parent. Given that they were true breeding and homozygous, every single pollen granule that was found in the male parent was carrying a capital T dominant allele on its chromosome. And given that the female parent had two little t's, every single ovum or egg 
in the female parent was carrying a chromosome with the recessive little t. That's all these parents have. That's all they can pass down to their offspring. But every pollen and every egg only has one chromosome that has either the capital T or the lowercase t on it. This means that when the male gamete or the pollen encountered the female gamete or the ovum when Mendel was fertilizing them with each other, the offspring were inevitably going to have a specific genotype and phenotype because 100% of the pollen granules contained a chromosome with the allele capital T, 100% of the female gametes contained a chromosome with the allele lowercase t, and when the two parents mate with each other, the offspring will get one copy of each, and therefore the offspring's genotype will be capital T, lowercase t, in all cases. This explains why in the F1 generation, 100% of the offspring had a smooth texture. Although they did get a wrinkled texture allele from their female parent, because they got the smooth textured allele from their male parent, they had the smooth textured phenotype because the dominant allele overrid the recessive allele. Now that part is not so difficult to understand. It gets a little bit trickier when we start looking at the F1 generation and how they self-pollinated in order to produce the F2 generation. So this is what the F1 generation looked like. Remember that these two components came from the same pea plant. So it was a matter of transferring the pollen from the anther of this plant directly to the ovary of the plant so it could fertilize the ova. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, what do the genetics of the gametes look like in this plant? Because we know that this plant has gametes, we know that it has pollen, and we know that it has ova, and that within those gametes there is a half set of chromosomes. So what do those chromosomes look like? Well. When the female part of the plant undergoes meiosis in order to produce the eggs or the ova, it will, of course, split apart those chromosomes into two separate ova, and therefore approximately 50% of the ova in this pea plant's ovary will be carrying a big T inside of them, and the other 50% of the ova will be carrying a little t inside of them because the parent is a mix. The same goes for the pollen granules. Because when meiosis takes place to generate the pollen, these two chromosomes will be split apart or segregated into two separate pollen granules, 50% of the pollen found in the anther will be carrying a capital T on their chromosome, whereas the other 50% will be carrying a lowercase t on their chromosome. So the bottom line here is that unlike in the true breeding parent generation, which only had one particular type of chromosome that they could pass down to their parents, the F1 generation is a mix. And in fact, there are two different types of alleles swirling around in the ovary and two different types of alleles swirling around in the anther here. This means that based upon sheer luck and chance alone, there were four different possibilities that could have come about from this pea flower pollinating itself. For example, if Mendel had managed to transfer a pollen granule containing a capital T and it had come into contact with a ovum containing another capital T, then the offspring of that cross would look like this two capital T's. That's one possibility. If, on the other hand, Mendel had managed to transfer, by chance, a pollen containing a capital T and it had encountered a ovum containing a lowercase t, then this means that the fertilized embryo would have this genotype instead. Third possibility is that Mendel would transfer a lowercase t, 
and it would fertilize an uppercase T, meaning that the fertilized embryo would have this genotype. And the fourth possibility is that Mendel, by chance, would transfer a lowercase t pollen, and it would fertilize a lowercase t ovum. And in this case, the fertilized embryo would look like this. Knowing this, knowing that there are four different possible genotypes that could come from the cross when Mendel was fertilizing these F1 generation plants with themselves, what phenotype for P texture would each of these offspring exhibit? You have the genotypes here. Tell me, what are the phenotypes? So to summarize what Mendel's principle of segregation told us, uh, it was able to explain why all of the F1 generation plants were round textured because it explained that each parent passed down one genetic particle and that one of those genetic particles ended up overriding the other one. It also was able to explain why in the F2 generation you saw the reappearance of the wrinkled texture specifically at a 3 to 1 ratio or thereabouts. This principle of segregation is the basis for the modern tool that we use for calculating and predicting the outcomes of particular genetic crosses, which is a tool called the Punnett square. Let's talk here about how you set up a Punnett square and use it to predict the outcome of a genetic cross. The first step in setting up this sort of tool is to figure out what alleles are in the gametes of each of the parents. Now, let's take the F1 generation self-pollinating as the focus of our example here. In the F1 generation self-pollination process, two pea plants, each of which had the genotype capital T, lowercase t, were crossed with each other. This means that the two possibilities that were found in the parents' gametes were capital T and lowercase t in both cases because the two parts were coming from the same plant. Once you figure out what alleles are in the gametes, then you create a table that has one column for each possible allele for the male parent as well as for the female parent. It doesn't matter if you put the female parent on the top or the male parent on the top, they can go either way. The outcome will still be the same. And then the third and final step is that you predict every possible fertilization outcome by taking the letter that is at the top of a column and the letter that is at the side of a row and writing them together in the box that corresponds to them. So if we were to fill in this table in this manner, here is what we get. We have two capital T's in this box because it is from a column with a capital T and a row with a capital T. In this box, we have a capital T and a lowercase t because we've got the capital up here and the lowercase over here. Oh, and this is a typo right here. Let me fix that really quick. There we go. Sometimes auto capitalization gets me. But this box down here contains two lowercase t's because it is in a row with a lowercase t and a column with a lowercase t. And so you get the idea. The content of these boxes here then allows you to predict what the offspring are going to look like. You can see that this has predicted that three out of four of the offspring will have the dominant phenotype because three out of four of them will have at least one capital T. Only one out of the four will have the recessive phenotype because only one out of the four will have two lowercase t's, which is the only way to have the recessive phenotype. If you think that this sounds like it makes perfect sense with the three to one ratio that is seen in Mendel's experiments, then that's because it does make perfect sense and this Punnett square thing followed from his conclusions that he made in his experiment.
Let's take a look at another example of a cross that Mendel also did in his experiment, where we complete a Punnett square to predict the ratios of offspring from a cross of an F1P and a wrinkled pea plant. Now the F1P, we know that its genotype was big T, little t. Therefore, when we complete the first step of predicting what is in this plant's alleles, we know that there are two different possibilities because it is heterozygous. Some of its gametes will have the capital T, and some of its gametes will have the lowercase t. If we look at the wrinkled pea, then we know that the wrinkled pea's genotype has to be little t, little t. Why do we know that? We know it because the wrinkled pea has the recessive phenotype of wrinkled texture. And the only way to have the recessive phenotype is to be true breeding for the recessive allele. Therefore, little t, little t. The wrinkled pea, because it is true breeding, can only pass down one possible allele to its offspring. And that only possibility is little t. So unlike in the last example, when we draw our Punnett square, it will be made with two columns corresponding to the two possibilities from the F1P, and only one row corresponding to the one possibility from the true breeding wrinkled P. Some of you may have learned, if you have previous experience with Punnett squares, to always draw them as a box containing four by four, but that is actually not always the case, and your Punnett square should not always look like that. It's okay to do that with simple Punnett squares like these ones, but later on in this lecture, when we get to uh, the incorporation of additional traits into our Punnett squares, you're going to see why it's not a good idea to make your Punnett squares the same size and the same shape every time, and rather instead to do it this way, where you pay attention to the different possibilities and make sure that your Punnett square matches the different possibilities for each parent here. Hence, for the F1P, there are two different possibilities that it will pass down. For the wrinkled P, there's only one possibility, so we have a two by one square. When we go to fill this square in, this is what we get. The interpretation of this is that we predict that 50% of the offspring will have the round or smooth texture. That would be contributed by these ones right here. The other 50% will have the wrinkled texture. When Mendel performed this experiment and he crossed the F1Ps with wrinkled peas, he found 106 round offspring and 102 wrinkled offspring, which is pretty dang close to the 50-50 split that is predicted by the Punnett square. Now here I'm going to ask you to put this terminology to the test. Tell me which term correctly describes each of the two parents in the cross, homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or heterozygous. And remember, tell me for each parent. It turns out that Mendel was not satisfied simply investigating peas that had one trait that was different between them. He also chose to cross peas that differed in two of their traits. So for example, he mixed peas that were true breeding round and yellow with peas that were true breeding wrinkled and green. When he did this, the F1 generation yielded, unsurprisingly, 100% smooth and yellow peas which could have been predicted from his first experiment on the principle of segregation. But when he allowed the F1 generation to self-pollinate, then he came up with a F2 generation that again presented a little bit of a surprising result for him. He found 315 yellow smooth peas, 108 green smooth peas, 101 wrinkled yellow peas, and 32 wrinkled green peas. The reason why this result was surprising and novel is because what he saw in the F2 generation 
was that traits could be remixed in ways that you didn't see in any of the previous generations. For example, he started off with a purebred smooth and yellow and a purebred wrinkled and green. But he saw that those traits did not have to stick together. Or in other words, smooth peas did not always have to be yellow and wrinkled peas did not always have to be green. Because in the F2 generation, there were smooth green peas and wrinkled yellow peas, which had not been seen in previous generations. He claimed to have done this cross for every single different possibility of the seven traits that he was studying, and he always found that the ratio of peas in the F2 generation was nine of one type to three of another type to three of another type to one of the last type. So, in his second hypothesis, which is also now known as a principle, he was dedicated to addressing the question, why are the F2 ratios always so close to this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 set? His second principle is now referred to as the principle of independent assortment, which states that the genes for any two traits, such as color, texture, height, flower position, pod color, etc., any two traits are independent and not passed down as a unit. The principle of assortment states that the inheritance of one trait has no effect on the inheritance of any other trait, and therefore yellow peas don't always have to be smooth and green peas don't always have to be wrinkled. The two traits are separate and they can mix with each other in any possible form. Just like we did with Mendel's first experiment, we're going to look back at his second experiment here and determine what genotypes were present in the parent generation. We know that the parent generation was true breeding once again for the traits that we are interested in. But now we are considering two separate traits instead of just one. So let's talk about the genotypes that the parents had for texture first. The smooth and yellow parent was true breeding for the smooth texture, and therefore, just like in the first experiment, it has the genotype capital T, capital T. The wrinkled green parent was true breeding for the wrinkled texture, and therefore we know it has the genotype lowercase t, lowercase t. We also have to talk about color. The first parent was true breeding for yellow color, and so we have to introduce another letter, another variable, to represent this whole other chromosome and this whole other allele for this separate gene. Because yellow is dominant to green, and because this first parent was true breeding, we know that its genotype for color was capital C, capital C. Over here, the other parent, their genotype must be lowercase c, lowercase c, because they express the recessive phenotype of being green. So, important point to make here, when you are talking about multiple traits, you have to have a pair of alleles for each trait. It's not enough to have a single T and a single C, um, or, you know, a single letter of, of each type. You have to have two Ts for texture and two Cs for color, because every individual has two alleles for every trait. Again, testing your terminology here, how would you describe the genotype of each parent for each trait? Homozygous recessive, homozygous dominant, or heterozygous? Now, let's take a look at what happened when this parent generation pollinated and reproduced with each other. We know that the smooth and yellow parent was true breeding for both traits and was dominant for both traits. Therefore, the male gametes, the pollen, would have had a chromosome carrying the capital T and a chromosome carrying the capital C. This makes sense because if we look up here, we see a total of four letters in this diploid organism. So we should expect in the haploid gametes, 
the haploid pollen, which only has a half set of genetic information, it should have only one T and one C because these chromosomes segregate. The same goes for the wrinkled and green parent, which is recessive and true breeding. And so in all of the ova here, we should see the recessive allele of T in combination with the recessive allele of C. When the pollination took place, this inevitably means that the F1 generation would have gotten a capital T and a capital C from their smooth and yellow parent, and a lowercase t and a lowercase c from their wrinkled and green parent. Therefore, the genotype of every organism in the F1 generation would have been capital T, lowercase t, capital T, lowercase c. They all are the same because their parents are true breeding. All of them received a big T and a big C from the smooth yellow parent. All of them received a little T and a little C from the wrinkled green parent. Therefore, they are heterozygous for both traits, both for color and texture. And we see that represented. We should have two T's here and two C's here, and we do. Now, here's where it gets the trickiest of all when the F1 generation pollinates with itself. Here's what these cells look like in the F1 generation P. They are heterozygous. There is a big C and a little c, a big T and a little t. When these F1 generation P's make their gametes during meiosis, those gametes are going to have exactly one C and exactly one T in them because they have to have a half set of genetic information and of course the P is going to pass down one allele for color and one allele for texture. Because the chromosomes segregate randomly during meiosis, there are actually four different possible outcomes, four different possible gametes that are going to be swimming around in the reproductive organs of this pea plant. One possibility is that the gamete will end up with a big C and a big T. This is one possible pollen or one possible ovum that will be in this pea plant. That's not the only possibility though. It's also possible that it will end up with a little C and a big T, creating this possible sperm or egg content. Third possibility is that a capital C and a lowercase t end up segregating together, making this possible gamete. And then the final possibility is that a lowercase c and a lowercase t segregate together, making this possible gamete. So this is a higher level of complexity than we've seen before, and what this really means is that if you were to peer into the pollen of this F1 generation plant, you would actually see four genetically distinct types of pollen in there. Likewise, if you were to look into the ovary and check out the ova in this pea plant, you would see four different types of eggs or ova in there, each of which has a different genetic content. Which pollen grain meets which ova is simply a matter of chance when the pollination, of pro pollination process is being carried out. So it is possible that this pollen could meet with this ova, or with this ova, or this one, or this one. It's possible that this pollen could meet this ova, or this one, or this one, or this one. And if we keep enumerating these possibilities, then we see that there's actually quite a few different genetic outcomes that can happen because this pea plant has all of these different gametes in its ovary and its anther. Now, luckily, the way that we predict the outcome among the offspring is using that Punnett square tool that helps us organize our thoughts on the matter.
the Punnett square in this case is going to have four different possible combinations of alleles on one side and four different possible combinations of alleles on the other side. So what we have here are the different genetic pollen grains and the different genetic ova. When we cross them in the middle, this is the outcome that we will get. And to quell any of your fears, this is the most complex that our Punnett squares could possibly get in this class. They can't possibly get worse than this one. When you're making an analysis to see what the offspring will look like, what you have to do is look at each individual square and determine what the phenotype would be of an offspring with that set of alleles. For example, if I look at this top square right here, this offspring, this baby pea plant, has two capital C's and two capital T's. Therefore, I know that its color is yellow. I can tell that from the capital C's. And I know its texture is smooth. I can tell that from the capital T's. On the other hand, if I look down here at this square, little c, little c, big T, little t, this baby pea plant, its color is green. I can tell that from the lowercase t's, or lowercase c's rather, and its texture is smooth, and I can tell that because it has at least one capital T. Now, I'm going to speed this process up for you and show you among the 16 squares that we see here what the different genotypes are. Nine out of the 16 genotypes will yield the yellow and smooth phenotype. Three out of the 16 will yield the green and smooth phenotype, specifically the three that you see highlighted in blue. Another three out of the 16 will be both yellow and wrinkled, the ones that you see highlighted in pink. And then finally, only one out of the 16 will be both green and wrinkled, the one that you see in green. If these numbers sound familiar, it's because they are the ratios that Mendel found in all of his experiments, which are directly correlated with and predicted by the Punnett square. So we know that this is how inheritance works. Let's take a look at another example of a cross that Mendel also did. Mendel took the F1P plant and he crossed it with a true breeding recessive plant for both the color and the texture traits. Let's say we want to predict the outcome of a cross between these two parents. We want to start by determining what we would see in their gametes, what we would find in their pollen and their ova. One of these parents is easier to determine this for than the other. But let's start with the more complex parent. The more complex parent is the F1 generation because it is heterozygous for both traits. This means that there are actually four different possible combinations of alleles that might be seen in its pollen or its ova. And those are capital C, capital T, capital C, lowercase t, lowercase c, capital T, and lowercase c, lowercase t. One common mistake that I see people make when they are trying to determine what would be found in the gametes of each parent is they write down two copies of the same letter together. You should always only have one letter of each. For working with C's and T's, you should have one C and one T. If you find yourself coming up with a possibility that this parent could pass down big T, little t as one of its allele combinations, that's not right because you've got two of the same letter. And you can't have two of the same letter because remember, in real life, these letters represent alleles. And this parent is only going to pass down one allele or one half of its genetic content for this particular trait. If you write down capital T, lowercase t, what that means is the parent is passing down two alleles for texture and no alleles for color, and that's not right. So now let's look at the other parent. The other parent is quite simple. It is true breeding and homozygous recessive on both counts. Therefore, 
every single pollen grain and every single ovum is only going to contain a lowercase c and a lowercase t. Now we have our Punnett square set up for us because we know that there are four different possibilities for one parent and only one possibility for the other parent here. Therefore, our Punnett square is going to be a four by one. We draw our Punnett square, and when we fill in the boxes, this is what you should get. When you analyze the different phenotypes represented by these different boxes, you would find that one out of four of them, or 25%, would have the yellow and smooth phenotype. Another one out of four, or another 25%, would have the green and smooth phenotype. The third possibility would be to have the yellow and wrinkled phenotype. And then finally, the green and wrinkled phenotype. When Mendel did this cross, he got these numbers right here. 24, 25, 22, and 27, respectively, for the four different possibilities, which is, again, pretty dang close to the 25% each that is predicted by the Punnett square. Now for this one, you guys are going to be on your own. I want you to complete a two-trait cross between peas that have the following genotypes, little c, little c, little t, little t, and big c, little c, big t, big t. Remember that the first thing you should do is figure out what combination of exactly one C and exactly one T can be in the alleles for each parent. Those are what make up the top and the side of your Punnett square. Then you draw your square, you fill in the boxes, and finally, what I want you to actually write down for me is what fraction of the offspring do you predict will be both yellow and round? And you get that by analyzing the boxes in your Punnett square. In this checkpoint, what I want you to do is restate Mendel's two principles in your own words. Tell me your understanding of the principle of segregation and your understanding of the principle of independent assortment.